from Philippines, but in Singapore, I'm guessing that you are stuck in Singapore. Uh, heard from one of my friends that it cost 8,000 sing to get back home. All right, so it's 8.30. Uh, let me just toggle over to my PowerPoint. All right, so for those who are joining over at our YouTube channel, welcome. Uh, we have one guy from Hungary as well. For those who are on our Facebook channel, um, welcome as well. So I'm um, actually running two concurrent streams. So today, this episode is really about an in-depth review of the pilot system. So we will take a look at that. And I know that um, in the past few weeks, I've actually released a cat drawing out so on Instagram and everybody's been asking us, uh, what sort of equipment is this? How much is this? So today, I'll just try to go through in depth uh, what are some of the equipments that we are using over here. All right, so today, um, my name is Yit, so I'm the principal consultant for RS and Aquaculture. So my background is really in the design, operating in RS system, clear water systems, design and operations of biofluid systems, and a wastewater technology. I'm an engineer by background. All right, so um, first things first, um, when we think about a design project or a shrimp farming project, there are several stages that we have to pay attention to. So first, we always start off from determining the customer's need. So I had a question earlier on on the prices of Monodon. So that's a good start. You Firstly, you need to understand what does your customer wants right, in the market and whether does that define a business case. right? So if that defines a business case, we then have to look at the process of how to farm shrimp. So uh, these are some of the process with regards to wastewater treatment, feeding, stocking density, you know, etc. Then only we start looking at the equipment design, right? So I know uh, most of us today are actually looking at the equipment design part, but there are actually a lot of other aspects that you have to pay attention to. For example, the process design as well as actual operations and optimization, all right? So today, I'm just going to touch on uh, the, our equipment design part um, for about 30 minutes or so. I'll take a little bit of questions and um, hopefully let you think about what, are, what other aspects are also equally important in what we call the developmental stages of, the, of any project, right? All right, so what are the... So talking specifically about uh, the, the processes we are trying to achieve, so these are some of the criteria that you need to understand before you look at equipments, right? So as you saw at the previous slide, the process design portion should be first before we talk about the equipment. So apart from all of these process parameters, for example, how much space do you need? Uh, how much, what's the water temperature, dissolved oxygen level, type of feed, etc. removing solid waste, ammonia, nitrates, nitrites, phosphate, calcium levels, magnesium levels, period. So, what I'm trying to really highlight over here is there are quite a lot of factors or a lot of processes that you have to take in mind before you start designing your equipment. So this part is really more about to assess your understanding of the fundamentals or what you actually need in a shrimp farming process, right? So if you understand, uh, out of this 26 points, if you understand more than 20, I think that you're doing a good job. You understand, you know what you're looking for. If you are below 10, right on some of this uh, score or you don't understand less than 10 of these processes then you probably have to revisit some of your process parameters before you look at designing your shrimp farming systems yeah okay so going into the pilot system detailed equipment design um so it consists of a couple of things so uh, of course first and foremost we have the shrimp culture tank so uh, this is highlighted over here, right? So you can look at where my cursor is, right? So these are the shrimp farming tanks. Uh, in which, inside these tanks, we have uh, the aeration systems that are used to provide oxygen into, um, into the biofloc or into the shrimp, right? And you have a submersible pump, right? So this is the general icon for the submersible pump that is used to pump out some of the biofloc. Uh, which is what we call effluent that is uh, decide, that you need to treat, right? So this effluent goes into a settling tank in which the settling tanks will knock out some of the majority of the biosolids and the water level then flows into a retention tank whereby you have a protein schema which utilizes what we call foam fractionation method to clean out some of the uh, finer solids. And lastly, this water being cleaned out, stripped up of all of, of its biosolids will then 
flow back into the tank as a clean filtrate. And from the settling tank and the protein schemas, you will accumulate uh, some waste that are being discarded um, either um, through using it as fertilizer or just, discard, just uh, discharging them as uh, solids. So typically, the settling tank uh, waste that is generated would be about 90-95% moisture content. It's still a little bit wet. Uh, so discharging it, uh, on the using it as fertilizer might be some of an issue for some of those guys who are in in a uh, slanted or uh, or uh, not so we have a high gradient topography all right so the so our so for our pilot systems just to share some of the performance data that was uh, actually occurred um, from our last batch right um, the last system we did not require any water change it was a zero exchange water uh, system uh, we have actually reused the water from our previous previous batch um, onto this batch. So the water has been actually recycled for two batch and each batch is about um, three months. So that brings us to about total of six months without water exchange. And the survival rate was actually about 79%. Yield is about seven kilos per cubic meter. And for those um, who are in the shrimp farming business already, we actually did not do any partial harvesting. Uh, we could have increased the yield by partially harvesting uh, at the earlier stage and the later stage, which would improve our yield. But uh, at this point, we won't, we are, we did not do that, right? So our DOC was about eighty three days, and our stocking was eight four hundred and eighty three shrimps at one gram sizes per cubic meter, right? So uh, this were pretty good data that we got out from our last batch. If I'm comparing this data with uh, traditional farms uh, that are located close to the sea which typically exchange about 30% and our improvement uh, in terms of yield and water exchange technology has actually uh, much better than the traditional farms. And uh, if you guys have been uh, following our channel for some time, you would have realized that the streams from our Bioflock systems were a bit um, clear or what we, we, what we say lack of pigmentation uh, on the last, last batch back in 2020 May. So this batch, we have actually corrected it um, through improved feed formulation. So that has been resolved. So you can see the shrimps over here are much has a better or has a better correlation in as compared to the last batch. All right, so the first piece of equipment is what we call the shrimp culture tanks. Uh, so it's actually the most, I wouldn't say the most important equipment, but it's one of the key element in the shrimp farming system. So this canvas tanks, what I really like about it is actually because it's a PVC membrane, so it's only one mm thick. Uh, the support is made from chrome. So as you can see, uh, when it's shipped or when you uh, when you've decided to you know keep these systems, you can see that you can actually fold it to a very small volume, which makes it easy to transport uh, and store, right? So we have used these tanks for more than a year now. Uh, we, the first tanks we got was in uh, 2019 from our samples uh, from China. So we have been using them uh, throughout the year. And apart from the rusting on the support, which can be easily rectified by just some grinding and repainting. Uh, apart from that, I really have uh, not much of a, a complaint for this equipment, right? So I did not have any leaks or or with the systems, although repair kits was actually provided, but we didn't actually use them until this point, right? So that's um, how does the equipment looks like. The dimension for this canvas tank is uh, two by two meters, right, on paper. But when you start to put water in, you realize that the that the tank actually start, starts to bulge, right, uh, in the center area. So at the actual footprint it, it requires is about 2.2 .2 times 2.3, right? So that's a, a important point to take note, All right? So that's for the um, culture tanks. Very simple piece of equipment. Um, of course, you can also use other options, right? You can also use concrete um, or you can use fiberglass tanks, both of which is uh, has their own pros and cons, right? So concrete, once you, you cure and set it, it's really hard to move. Um, for fiberglass, it's really hard to transport. So unless you're making the fiberglass on site, uh, which in parts of, uh, apart from, you know, places in Singapore or even you're in Australia or Europe will be a bit tricky to make because of the chemicals that are involved. Uh, so really pros and cons of using a canvas tank is really easy transport. You can place it anywhere. You can wash it after every cycle, dry it, 
can be repaired, affordable. Uh, lifespan wise, I wouldn't say it will last more than concrete or fiberglass, right? Um, the metal support is chrome, but I don't think it will last more than five years. Um, for some of the clients actually ask us for stainless steel support, but uh, it's a bit tricky to get stainless steel is because stainless steels are usually a bit softer than mild steel, right? Or yes, it has better corrosion resistance, but it doesn't have the structural strength to withstand that kind of um, integrity, uh, structural requirements. So these are our new tanks, it's about 20 tons. Um, so it's a five by three meters uh, times 1.2 meter height. So as you can see, we are still sticking with our fiber. Uh, we are still sticking with our canvas tank option as of now, uh, until we probably find a more permanent space. Because right now we are renting in a, a two thousand square feet shop lot, smack right in the middle of the town, right without access to seawater uh, access. So the second piece of equipment that we use, um, you can you can roll back uh, the previous uh, slide and you can actually take a look that we actually have a, a pump. That, that are used to pump out what we call the biosolid or any uneaten feed into the settling tank. So this is the pump that we've been using. Of course, you can use the standard um, submersible pump uh, with um, where the suction points is right in front of the pump, or you can use these special pumps whereby they have a bottom suction uh, a system where they will pick up the solid or settled solids right down in the bottom. So that's really important in a biofloc system because you do not want to have accumulated sludge in the canvas tank. So this is really important. You want the sludge to be accumulating in areas that you allow it to accumulate. For example, the settling tank, right? Because what tends to happen is once you have accumulation and once the shrimp starts eating this settlement of sludge, you sort of develop uh, problems uh, like EMS or etc. Yeah, so these pumps are uh, we have actually standardized all of our pumps in our farms for the crab farm and the shrimp farm to use this particular model uh, because it's actually very eco friendly, running on only 18 watts and it has a ceramic shaft uh, which provides really long lifespans. Of course, you can also use some other DC pumps with flow reg regulations or some inverter. Uh, but for us, um, this is actually quite a good option in terms of uh, affordability and uh, reliability. All right, so um, the third part of the equipment is actually what we have is our settling tanks. So these settling tanks are a bit special. We we don't we don't use any DIY equipment. We have tried that before. Uh, I'll try to explain what's the issue of trying to DIYing this piece of equipment. So this uh, fiberglass that you see over here, so this is this tank, you know, this conical blue, light blue tanks over here, which you see being highlighted at my cursor, right? So it has a, what we call a cone bottom to accumulate the flux at the bottom part to be discharged, right? So this is actually a fiberglass tank uh, consisting of about four layers, so that brings about four mm. And the support that we have over here is actually a fiber reinforced support. Um, it's not too heavy, so I don't think a steel support uh, would be required. So it's about 30 liters of water, and the retention time for biosolid is about 30 to 60 minutes. Right? You might not be familiar with the word retention time. Probably a good idea to hit to Google this after this webinar. Right? Of course, other other alternatives, of course, you can use what we call these chemical drums here. Uh, what we have been using before, so this was back in early twenty, late twenty nineteen, uh, sort of setup that we have over in our crab farm. You probably scroll through our channel and you probably look at, oh, you know, we were using these sort of drums as a settling tanks. Um, cheap option, uh, definitely affordable. Um, but I would realize I think that it's not very efficient. Uh, the main reason is due to this effect. So if you're using a cone bottom drum, uh, like what we have here. So after settlement, you will see a nice settlement layer right over here. Once you drain it, you get most of it out, right? I would say 99% or 95% out. But if you use a flat bottom uh, tank, which is the ones that commonly is being used for DIY, the sludge settlement tends to happen um, like this. And after draining, right, what sort of happens, you don't drain all the sludge, meaning to say that you probably only drain out 20 to 30% of the sludge. So if you're looking at your your setting tank and you if you're using this DIY sort of chemical drum you will always see what we call floating sludge on top of the tank and this is often due to not efficient draining of the biosolids so once the solid starts to accumulate at the tank bottom over a certain period and you don't drain them effectively what 
happens is actually denitrification. You have bacteria that is actually producing methane in this what we call flock and bringing the flock up, rising them up again. So it's a rising sludge problem commonly happen in a wastewater uh, setting pond or etc. Yeah. So I would think it's probably a bit better if you use a cone bottom. Um, if not, you'll be spending all your days just trying to clean out the settling tank, which is a lot of effort. Definitely not ideal for someone who's who's planning to do this on a you know on a site uh, on a site. Yeah. So that's uh that's uh, one of our observations from this. So the fourth piece of uh, the fourth piece of equipment is actually the protein schemas. Um, so generally, you want the settling tanks to be removing 80-90% of the solids and allowing the fine solids to be removed by the protein schemas, right? So uh, of course, protein schemas, you can get them off the shelf, you can buy them from aquarium shops. There are, there are plenty of these equipments around in the market. But generally, what we see after the post-protein schema treatment is you can see that the water is actually very, very clear, right, at this point. Strip out of the heavy solids in the settling tanks, um, then again refine throughout the protein schemas, right? So very small footprint, efficient. So usually we 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 don't want to be pumping the water into the protein schema. We prefer the gravity fed option. Um, that will be a little bit better on our side. So um, just a, a important note that I I always see among people who are applying this protein schema in in the bioflock system is you really need to know when to stop running your effluent through the protein schema because sometimes the protein schema will break up the flock, right? So you can't be operating them 24-7, seven, seven days a week for the whole culture cycle because that basically breaks up the flock. Uh, as a result, your flocks cannot be utilized by the shrimp and it cannot be removed in the setting tank. So please um, do take note what you're trying to do. And one of the standard um, sizing for the protein schemas in the RAS system and the Biofox system are actually very different. So do not try to use the RAS system methodology for sizing protein schema and use it in the Biofox setup because it will be probably oversized, right? So, um, so going back to my previous points, whether should we run the schema or not to run the schema, there is no straightforward answer. It really depends on the type of flocks that you're getting. Sometimes your flock will be a little bit more um, what we call compact in nature, like the picture over here on the left. Sometimes it has a little bit more filamentous bacteria on the right. So if you look at standard wastewater literature, this is what we call filamentous bulking. Um, it really depends on what sort of bioflock you are running. No, no two bioflocks are the same. Um, that will depend on the feed you're providing uh, on the type of carbohydrates, on the feed to microorganism ratio. So a lot of factors, uh, not straightforward, really takes a lot of experience to have a good judge whether to run a protein schema or not, right? So take note of this. So if we combine some of this equipment, you have the, the shrimp tanks and the settling tanks and you have the protein schema and the retention tank, how does it all look if you're looking at it from the side? So, the water level is something that I get um, I get pretty often. So this question I get from a lot of my participants. So the way I like to look at it is you want to be only using a single pump, right? So everything else is flowed by gravity. So the, that pump is only responsible for picking up the effluent in the middle of the pond up to the clarifier where it's settled for some time and the clean water is actually flowed, overflow by gravity into the retention tank whereby it is actually being worked in the protein schema. And after it's being worked into the protein schema, it actually overflows back into the shrimp culture tank, right? So only using a single pump to control um, everything. So it's straightforward, no trying to balancing all the flow kind of problem, no overflowing here and there. So pretty straightforward. Um, so if you are designing your system, just take note that um, you probably have three water level, X1 being the water level of the shrimp culture tank, X2 being the water level at the settling tank and X3 being the water level at the retention tank. So generally, you want the, re the settling tanks to be the highest, followed by the retention tank whereby the protein schema is actually working at this point. Yeah, And lastly, it's only being flowed towards the shrimp culture tank. All right? So that's bringing all together the shrimp culture tanks, settling tanks, protein schema, all pumped by a single pump. Yeah. 
So not to mention, what about aeration systems? All right, so aeration systems really differs uh, on the design tanks, but uh, we have tried a lot of settings, uh, airlift, aerotubes. So we have tried uh, many of these uh, configurations. Uh, so so I'll, I'll, I'll probably highlight what have how what have worked for us. Um, so for us, we're actually using a 300 liter per minute pump. And when you're looking at pumps, you need to make sure they are able to operate at at least one meter depth because your tanks are a meter depth, right? But you're not going to fill up all your water up to a meter. It's only going to be about 0.8 or 0.85 meters, leaving 15 cm away from the water towards the rim of the tank. So for us, how we do it is actually like this. Um, we have an air compressor that was previously, you know, the 300 liter air compressor. And this is actually running at half a horsepower, yeah? So it's actually still oversized for this setup, but you know, you could always reuse the air compressor for other systems in the future. I actually, you know, advise a lot of my clients to get up, you know, to get an air compressor, uh, a bigger air compressor for your future project and you know, can run it on smaller systems, right? So for us, we actually use what we call an uh, arrow tube. So these are actually a perforated tubes whereby once you pump air through, it actually create what we call a diffuse air bubble throughout the tube. So it's just like an elongated uh, air stone, yeah? But of course it's flexible, All right? So how do we connect it is uh, through the air compressor, we actually split the lines throughout two points, right? Point, for example, this point, and the air will travel through this, what we call perforated rubber hose, yeah? So it, it actually travels both ways, and another airline will be introduced at this point, and in which air will also travel throughout this direction. Uh, actually, this is wrong. This, uh, this arrow should be in the reverse direction. So basically, it's actually providing air throughout the perforated rubber hose and providing aeration. So imagine you are running this aeration system in your tank. What tends to happen is you have what we call a teacup effect in which all of your biosolid will actually accumulate into the middle. And this is the point whereby you should be start to pump them out to the settling tanks. So for us, uh, when we tried to do this, we actually found a lot of problems getting the correct fitting to fit the flexible hoses into the arrow tubes. So actually we actually, uh, treat, we actually made custom prints from our, using our 3D printed um, to sort of uh, air, to relay some of the air. So you can see these are some of the 3D printed parts that we actually use in our farm. All right, this is actually planted, uh, this is actually built, printed with a PLA filament. So um, quite, afford quite affordable and as well as, uh, it's actually quite durable as well. All right, so that's actually, um, that's actually what we have for our pilot system, right? So if I were to go back to the previous chart earlier, right? So we actually covered um, the equipment design portion, yeah? So actually, if you take a look at, you probably, you know, you probably realize that, you know, most of these equipments can be, can be purchased off the shelf or it can be, can be bought DIY or you can even do your own DIY system. What we are trying to bring across is that the key is not really so much on the equipment side, but really to understand what's the underlying process, right? What are you trying to govern? What are you trying to control? What are you trying to do in general, right? So, and also it will give you um, that background or, or understanding in the process will also give you, an high, will go through, give you a great insight on ter in terms of commissioning the system as well as optimizing the system, right? I wouldn't say, uh, I mean, equipment do play a part, uh, but it's not as is nowhere near as important as uh, understanding the fundamentals, right? So the whole point of this system is not to be um, profitable or it will not make you a millionaire overnight. The pilot actually serves as the bare minimum you need to get enough knowledge, feedback and experience in running the systems. So for those who have been following our ch channel for years, you, you would have seen that we have actually adopted these similar systems uh, for just one unit one and a half years ago, all right? So we have actually refined the process, uh, worked on our understanding of the systems before we actually get to this point where we're actually scaling up our into a commercial systems, all right? So the key is try, really trying to understand where are you trying to head towards this. So the, the key point is you will probably take realistically one and a half years just to get the hang of the operations in terms of understanding the process 
uh, and trying to optimize some of the variables. Uh, a reminder is it actually took us one and a half years to learn this biofog properly and we have three to four years of Clearwater Systems experience, right? So if you are following our company's trajectory, let's say you spend two or three years trying to understand the process, you know, trying to refine, optimize um, operation. You spend two to three years understanding the process. So what's the next step? You have to scale up. But what have you actually ignored at this point, right? Do you actually understand the customer needs, right? Um, or do you have, have you actually accurately defined what is your purpose in this business, right? So I know a lot of our clients do follow our channel uh, because of uh, the technology that we have actually been using or the some of the you know probiotics or some of the key insights in the process part or you know some of the automation technology we have been using but more than often what you don't see in front of the youtube or our facebook uh, channel is a rigorous understanding of the business aspect right so companies that we we've encountered uh, or clients we've uh, encountered um for for the past few years are usually overly focused on technology, right? So they are either coming from a technology background or engineering background, and they do not often realize or understand the ROI, profitability or risk, or what's the scalability of the model, right? So, and they often find this only after two to three years of operations. And by that time, you probably have spent a lot of money, right? So our, our, our business uh, is actually dependent on helping people understand issues, uh, really upfront in the projects to identify whether this is is a bad this has a valid business case for anybody before you start looking at the nitty gritty part which is like the process design equipment design optimization and commissioning right so that's where we try to address most of our clients and try to help most of our clients understand what sort of market they are looking at right so for us we actually deal with the live stream market where our streams are actually not so frozen no, it's not so it's not so fresh either. It's actually so live, right? And our farm is actually located um, right now in the urban area. So it's actually literally in the housing project, right? So it's just uh, located in a neighborhood of houses. So we do have a what we call um a quite um encouraging and a supportive uh, local ecosystem whereby we are able to sell our shrimp too right so this these people have actually been very supportive of our business but that business case has to be defined in a very early stage all right so once you once you understand the pilot the business model is always it's never too late to scale up right at the end of the day the stream industry has been around for years right so um whatever catching up you have to do um you 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 probably have to do it but you know you don't have to be overly concerned about competition right so because the shrimp industry at the moment uh, has still a lot of growth in terms of opportunity in terms of optimization and the adopt adoption of biofog technology right so this is just one of the sample systems that we have actually designed for our clients so you can see that it's actually um it's a 40 ton 45 ton uh, production setup so this system is only 32 by 9 meters only one tenth of an acre right so using a one acre land, you can probably fit 10 sets of these, which gives you about one, about 30, 350,000 US dollars in, um, in production, right? So this system was actually designed for one of our clients in, uh, in the Middle East, right? So um, we are not projecting this system to be sold at a very high price. It's only selling at a seven to eight US dollars, um, US dollars per kilo. So don't worry don't worry so much about scaling up uh, once you got the basic right you can always scale up right um, scaling up is uh, if you imagine scaling up is really like um, a bucket of water if your bucket is leaky right uh, which is probably due to lack of understanding lack of proper optimization it doesn't matter how much water you try to take because your bucket is always leaky right it's really important you understand the fundamentals and sure your bucket is not leaking at the first place before you start scaling up right um shrimp farming uh, what's what's the most cap the cap is capital intensive not because of the equipment but more of on the operating costs 
of things. For example, the feed cost, the PL cost, manpower cost, right? So the risk in failure is actually very, very high. Not so much of losing the equipment, but just losing your, you know, your cash flow. All right, so, um, so for those, uh, so it's nine o'clock now, uh, 35 to 30 minutes uh, webinar session. So for us, uh, basically we do courses to help people understand, not just on the theoretical aspect or practical aspect, but also on the business case to help you identify the profitability business, really helping you understand the key pillars before going into the detailed process design or, or equipment design. Yeah. So for us today, uh, for those who are in Malaysia, we welcome you to join some of our courses in Kuang, Johor, right? So that's, that's about 1,006 per person. Uh, right now, I know we have the MCO, so I'm guessing that we probably have to commence only in March. So too bad. Um, for those who are out of Malaysia, our international clients, uh, I'm pretty sure you probably know that we have an online course uh, for 199 US dollars. Um, what's good about this online course is you can get a full rebate on the online course once you start joining over in Malaysia. For example, you'll only be paying 199 once, right? So uh, our online course is about 199 Now offline course in Malaysia is about 400 uh, US dollars. So once you go in, you know, you only pay the, 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 the remaining balance, yeah? So um, I know we have clients that are really interested in the pilot system. So I hope I sort of answered some of your questions uh, in the previous web, in the in this webinar. So hopefully it gives you a better idea of why do we do certain things and why do things you know cost a bit more in certain areas. So I hope I've addressed that. So for those who have registered online, you're eligible for to get the um, the pilot systems for about thousand four one four five zero US dollars. Um, so this is actually only available for our clients who are available in this webinar session. So for those who are interested, do drop us an email or WhatsApp or Facebook or Facebook message that you're interested. We'll share you a special quotation because normally this is priced at about thousand six US dollars. Um, for those who haven't enrolled, you can probably look at our online and uh, physical cost option, which is about one five nine nine, and you get an additional fifty US dollars off the pilot systems. This equipment does not include shipping right so uh shipping is a bit tricky because we have a lot of clients from all different countries so we probably have to work out this individual shipping cost uh, that is to be bet by the consumers right so we also have the physical cost option which will allow you to purchase a pilot system for 1450 as well all right so the core parts of the pilot system will include a 400 liter 4000 liter a uh, culture tank, the cone bottom fiberglass tank, the water retention tank whereby you're putting your protein skimmer, submersible pumps, air compressor. We also provide you the aero tubes and 3D, 3D printed parts. Um, I'm also really inclined to throw in you guys an offer to put in probiotics to help to start up the biofloc uh, system. But for some countries, I can't because of uh, importing regulations. Uh, nowadays, it's a bit strict to send probiotics uh, because uh, microorganisms in plastic bottles nowadays are quite sensitive. So um, that will, if your country importations allow, I will just give it for you for free. Just a quick startup kit. So that's all for my side. Um, so thanks for joining us at the uh, our webinar session today. Um, this is my contact number. I see that some people are actually asking for my contact number or even email. You can always find us on our Facebook and our website. So it's 9.04, uh, 35 minutes webinar presentation. So I'll take 10 more minutes to answer some of the questions that were asked on either our Facebook and um, YouTube page. So I'll go on the Facebook one first. So somebody's actually asked us about our stocking density. Um, I think somebody answered on Facebook, but basically we are stocking uh, our grow out tanks with five with about four eighty five pls per cubic meter. Know that our pls are already one gram, right? So I don't know what you what's the standard industrial term to call them uh, because everybody's quoting different numbers. But when I say stocking my grow out tank with four hundred eighty five, means the shrimps are already at one gram size. Typically, if you buy them at PL17, you'll need another additional two to three weeks to get them up to one gram size. 
So we actually, this is actually post nursery, yeah. Um, we are stocking them. I'll grow at about four hundred eighty-five. Uh, why four hundred eighty-five and not five hundred? Uh, it's because sometimes when we buy PL, they don't usually give us the correct number. It's usually more or less. So this is what we've got. Um, could we go higher? Yes. Uh, is there a need? Depends. Uh, depends on your rental cost, manpower cost, etc. Um, but I would say if you're wanting to aim comfortable. Aim 200. If you want to go high risk, high reward, aim 400 to 500. Our harvest volume is actually about 5 to 7.5. Um, if you are very stocking with initial, very high stocking density, about 485, you should be getting 7 to 7.5. Uh, actually, we got a range 6.5 to 7.5. Uh, really depends on how you calculate the water volume because your water volume is not going to be consistent all the time. Sometimes water level decreases, you have to top up with water due to evaporation, right? Um, can you incorporate bioflock to aquaponics? Um, so that's I hope I hope I uh, I've answered that uh, stocking density, harvest volume kind of question. Um, for our nursery side, we are actually stocking with thousand five to two thousand five hundred PLs per cubic meter, right? So a lot of people out there in the market has been claiming crazy numbers. So these are the numbers that we are actually stocking at. Is this the highest in the world? No, right? There are people in the US who have done higher, uh, harvest volume getting about 9, 9 to 11 kilos per cubic meter. So people have actually done that already. What we are quoting are people that are based on numbers that have actually done. I'm not saying that we are uh, at the moment the world's best, uh, but we are trying to get there. Um, second question, can you incorporate bioflock to aquaponics? Um, I don't know. Um, no straightforward answer to this because our bioflock systems are actually designed for a brackish water system, 10 ppt. Unless you can find a plant that can sustain 10 ppt of saltwater abuse, um, I think you probably can. Another way is probably to harvest the flocks uh, through the settling tank, settling tank and the protein schema and use that as a form of fertilizer, which is high in potassium, chloride, uh, magnesium, calcium because it's stripping out some of the water from the seawater anyway. Uh, must the tanks be rectangular? No, it can be round, it can be a raceway kind of setting. Uh, rectangular is just happens to be one of the, the smaller units that I can find. And I prefer to use rectangular because it's a bit more space efficient. And anyways, if you buy a rectangular tank, after you fill in water, it sort of gets to a opal oval or a sort of a rounder shape, an octagonal shape, right? So um, the reason why you want to use rectangular or circle versus rectangular really depends on mixing. Of course, round tanks give you better mixing. Rectangular tank gives you uh, not so good mixing, but you save a bit more space. Really a trade-off. You can use both, right? What is the net power consumption of this project? Uh, depends. Our pilot is about 300 watts. Uh, if you plus in the pump, it's about 318 watts. But all pumps and all compressors doesn't work at 100% efficiency. Usually it's about 50 to 60%. Um, really depend on what's your... So I don't really understand what you mean by this project, whether it's our current project or our previous project or the pilot project. If the question is regards to pilot, it's about 300-ish watts installed but not operated. Remember, you have to include the efficiency term into it. Uh, do we monitor the nitrate level? Yes, we do monitor the nitrate levels. Our nitrate levels never exceed 60 ppm, right? So I don't know why everybody's really worried about nitrate, but as long you have proper settling tank management, because settling tank performs a denitrification setting as well. It denitrifies, you recover some of the you recover some of the nitrates into alkalinity. We know that already. So if it's operated under this setting, our nitrates are usually okay. How do we handle a disease outbreak? Couple of ways, biosecurity is one, getting certified PR is another, uh, probiotics is another. Generally, the bioflock protects the shrimp from disease. Uh, we see that uh, all the time. Um, do we have a disease mechanism? How does bioflock? Yes, but it's uh, probably quite complex. But what we can say is the bioflock protects the shrimp internally by by layering their mi microbiome with uh, beneficial bacteria. So when they ingest sludge or some feed that is uh, laden with vibro their intestinal tract don't get infected by vibro that's one way of uh, one way of protection second way is 
uh, the biofog actually acts like um, sort of a sensing system for the bio uh, for the stream. Once it detects um, that, uh, harmful bacteria or viruses, it will actually trigger. Uh, it actually acts like an immuno 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 stimulant for the stream to start produce more um, what we call um, uh, bacteria fighting cells. I can't remember the term. Uh, on top of my head at this point so that's the second mechanism uh, but gen uh, the third mechanism will also include a competitive exclusion strategy so in your biofog system your biofog system is usually dominated by good bacteria that tries to uh, sort of push out or or, or sort of uh, exclude the bad bacteria so reducing on bad bacteria in the first place so a couple of ways uh, which way is dominant uh, I don't really know. I, I, I'm pretty sure that a lot of people don't know as well. Uh, it's more of a research question as, as of now. All right. Uh, so I'm just trying to read off some of the questions I have on YouTube. Uh, do you provide... Okay, so... Uh, please provide a webinar on a pilot mud crab system. Uh, okay, I can try to do that. Uh, but mud crab system, pretty straightforward. You can just get some boxes, DIY, make your own RAS system. More, more importantly is not how to, not um, what equipment to use and try to understand uh, the, the, the design criteria and why we use certain things. So, of course, our company can exist trying to sell equipment to you, but I don't think we'll be in business at this point in time. So, our company really succeeded um, with clients is because we don't try, we, we, most of the time, we don't try to sell you. We don't try to we don't try to sell you the fish. We try to teach you how to fish. That's more important at this point of time because uh, we run an aquaculture company as well. We can't be always affording to pay uh, exorbitant fees for someone to install our system. We ourselves owe it to our shareholder and owe it to ourselves to try to understand what we are buying and why it's the design criteria in the first place. Okay, don't be surprised that you know most of the suppliers or uh, you talk to that do not have an idea on. The proper design methodology as well um does your course provide anything or diy feed um at the moment no because a uh, shrimp feed is actually quite uh, easily available at the market uh, but i think um this is not true for everybody in the world uh, in asia yes but i'm pretty sure in some parts of africa or in some parts of cambodia as well uh, feed are quite difficult to get so we have not actually a, a section in the course that does DIY feed, uh, but we do have feed making experience. Um, probably we can come up with a, a subtopic for DIY feed. Um, for those who are enrolled in our course as well, there's actually a forum section in our course whereby we have a lot of participants actually asking questions and our consultants will go through and reply some of the questions from time to time. I think that DIY feed should be one of our topics on our forum. And if you have enrolled, probably a good idea to start that off. I'll give you some background calculation and feed making techniques. We've, we have done them in the mud crab days, but we have not done them in the stream farming days because of um, it's simply not uh, economical for us to try to uh, make feed at a small scale in Asia, but it probably be economical for you guys who are based in, uh, for example, Uganda, right? So rectangular tank, I've answered this already. Um, what is the best way to harvest the stream during harvest before they die off okay good question i like this question a lot so what do you think this answer is based on is it based on technical uh, answer do i have to answer oh yeah because you know the biofog system can only provide x amount of oxygen before the stream starts to die off right so the correct answer to this question this is not a technical question this is a commercial question right you really have to understand what it what does your target market want for example why partial harvesting, pa partial harvesting doesn't really work for us, right? Yes, I could harvest a stream at 10 grams, which is about 100 counts per kilo. But who would buy our products, right? We target a very premium sector that buys live stream. They need to eat the stream at 40 counts or 30 counts. Because if I'm selling them 100, uh, 100 count stream, they'll be probably better off trying to buy off with a frozen dealer or someone else, right? So you really have to understand what are you trying to achieve in your business context. Uh, before you try to adjust some of your process uh, process parameters so for me i you i like to harvest them at minimum 50 counts but um for me business wise it's better to sell them at 40 counts so for me next batch we are going to harvest at 40 counts 40 count stream is ideal 
uh, because it's big enough to sort of uh, present the dish on its own because we are usually doing this on an Asian setting so think about Asian restaurants if it's too small you will probably be only be using them as what we call uh, in a fried rice dish or fried meat, fried I don't know, fried uh, noodle dish, which is sort of, you know, not the star. But if you get them, you need to get them up to at least 40 counts so that they can become sort of the dish on their own. Maybe, I don't know, salted egg shrimp or some other, other curry shrimp or, you know, some other flavor. How big uh, aerator is installed for this pilot system? So the aerator is 300 watt system, very small aeration, uh, provides 300 liters per minute. How to prevent cannibalism? Um, how to prevent cannibalism? Stocking density is one, do not exceed a certain stocking density. Second is make sure they have enough feed, right? Can you give us an idea of the power consumed in seven kilos per cubic meter? Uh, okay. Um, this one requires a bit more detailed calculation. I don't have the numbers on top of my head because for me, I'm using in our setup, we are using a commercial blower 1.5 horsepower for 200 kilos 200 to 300 kilos 250 kilos of production okay um how we how to avail your bioflot cost promotion after this webinar so if you're interested just drop us a drop us a drop us a whatsapp or email then we'll redirect you, redirect you to our website you can register to our course and when you register, there will be a timestamp on the course that you register. We can probably we know that you have registered to the course, and from there we will only uh, sell you the pilot. So for us, we are not really inclined to selling anybody the pilot who has never, uh, who has never enrolled in our online course because partly I'm really afraid that you not you are not sure what you're doing, and in the event of failure, most of the time, everybody have the tendency of blaming equipment, but usually it's not the equipment that is at fault. It's usually the process understanding all right so i think uh that's it for today um it's 9 17. uh thank you for everybody who's joined taken the time to join the webinar uh, mark your calendars two weeks from now we'll have a probiotics webinar session on the application and the theory theory of probiotics which i think is really important if you're looking at biofox systems and Tricks from now, I'll try to do a webinar session on the consumables that are needed for the probiotics uh, for starting up your bioflock. What are the probiotics that you need? What are the salt that you need? Uh, what are the feed that you need? PL, you know, this, this sort of stuff. Uh, is it possible to travel to Malaysia to learn? Unfortunately, I think at this point of time, we can't. Um, I really hope you can come, uh, but I'm not too sure whether the risk is um, worth the reward and I'm not sure whether our regulatory policies at the moment allow people to visit Malaysia. So uh, as much as I would love for you guys to come, the online course is the only option. So I would highly suggest you enroll in the online course first. Start your you know pilot, I don't know, with your DIY setup or purchase our setup, whichever way, right? After purchasing, run it for some time. Uh, there is no clear sight on when this pandemic is going to end. I don't know whether it's going to be this year or next year. But hopefully at that point, you are ready to scale up. Come over. We have a chat. Let me understand some of your business processes, what you're trying to achieve financially. Um, what's your consumer? What's your consumer preference? Then from there, we can probably fine tune a little bit about uh, your business model, right? So... Do I do a webinar on fish, ras, or biofox system? Uh, for this is a question from Jack. Um, I we we actually do fish farming. We have tilapia farms, but uh, that's more on a standard pond method. Um, this is actually about this is actually a webinar on biofox, so I'm not too sure. Or oh, probably you're asking me, do I do fish with biofox system? We are thinking of it. I'm thinking of starting a new course for Bioflock Tilapia, Bioflock Jade Perch, but I'm too busy at the moment, so probably have to wait until Q, Q2 at least. Uh, are you going to provide a certificate? Uh, no, Edward, you probably asked me three times already. So this is just a webinar. I'm sorry we can't provide you a certificate. Um, certificates are only available for clients who have enrolled in the course. 
Hopefully I'll see you during the course and we can give you that certificate that you are looking for. Okay, so hopefully I've answered all of our questions. Ah, I got a nice one here. Does black tiger shrimp eat bioflock? Um, not really. I don't think they like. I don't think black tiger shrimp likes bioflock in particular because they are a bit more um, carnivorous. Uh, this goes the same as groupers as well. The shrimp um organism that prefers bioflocks are usually omnivorous or herbivores. I don't think carnivorous species do prefer bioflock. Um. Probably not, but you can still use them for a water treatment kind of concept. Yeah. All right. So that's all for today. Thank you for joining again. I've gotten a lot of lovely questions, and this month I'll try to do more webinar sessions. I do enjoy interacting and answering questions from the crowd.